I call the member Julian Genta. Tanako, Mr. Speaker. Tanako to Etifare. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about two issues that are really at top of mind for those people living in Auckland, and that is transport and housing. I'm, I'm sure most New Zealanders living, uh, watching at home, whether or not they live in Auckland, are aware that both transport and housing affordability are critical issues in Auckland. Uh, Auckland desperately needs better buses and trains and safe walking and cycling. During the campaign, I was up in Auckland traveling around quite a bit and I traveled on off-peak buses that had 15 or 16 people standing on them, two mothers with prams in the middle of the day, um, completely chocker. The trains have been completely chocker and that's been uh, reflected in the latest patronage stats which show in September, for example, rail patronage year to date was up 16.8%. This is phenomenal growth and it's actually been increasing month on month. The growth rate has been increasing. So this is happening very, very quickly. The Northern Express Busway, patronage was up 18.6% year to date. Uh, it's almost 20% growth year on year. So uh, Aucklanders are flocking to buses and trains to the extent which they're actually over full. And um, I note that the new Minister of Transport, Simon Bridges, um, is, uh, is in the chamber and I'd, I'd like to invite him to join me for a transport tour in Auckland sometime to see just how desperately Aucklanders need capital investment in public transport. And the reason that's important is because Britta Mart, our rail network, is, ac is actually at capacity already in terms of the number of trains that can get through at peak hour. So we can't uh, increase the frequency of the trains to make it more convenient for people to take the train, but also to ensure that fewer people are standing on the very full trains, as they are already are full, until the city rail link has been built. So we need this critical investment. The Green Party campaigned hard on a positive transport vision that was fully costed for Auckland, um, and I believe that uh, the National Party would be missing a huge opportunity if they didn't take um, if they didn't invest in public transport, because that is essential to the future economic development of Auckland um, and of New Zealand. Of course, the other side of this is uh, housing affordability. And um, I've heard uh, the Prime Minister and, and other government members make reference to both transport and housing affordability in their speeches um, at the commencement of this parliament. And unfortunately, I don't think National has got it. I don't think they've got exactly what's going on here because uh, we've got the Minister for the Environment um, and Housing, uh, Nick Smith, Dr. Nick Smith, stating that um, he's going to solve, that we're going to uh, tackle the housing affordability problem by freeing up more Greenfields land on the fringe in Auckland. Now, interestingly, this is actually going to exacerbate our transport problem. So while land is cheaper on the fringe of urban areas, because it's not where people want to be, transport costs are much higher on the fringe of urban areas. So we could uh, free up more land for more houses, um, take up the very valuable and productive farm land, uh, which is currently used to produce food, um, and cover it with houses, as they've done in Southern California and other urban areas, uh, places that I'm quite familiar with. We could do that and people would have mortgages uh, that would be lower, their house prices would be lower, but their transport costs actually outweigh the benefits of the more affordable housing. And there's been um, a good deal of research on this around the globe, but most notably recently to the New Zealand Institute of Econ uh, Economics, there was a, a research paper presented which analyzed just this effect for Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch. And what it demonstrated was that households uh, who lived further from the city centre, uh, spent less on their rents, rents decline as you move out, but they spend more on their commuting costs to the extent which they're actually spending more overall. So if we um, achieve the goal of cheap houses by taking up our beautiful Greenfields productive farmland um, and allowing developers to make a quick buck uh, by developing houses out there, those households are actually going to be at risk of significant transport costs to access jobs, services, education, all those things that they need to access um, in order to earn a living and, um, and to make their households work. So here's the opportunity. If you get the connection between housing and transport affordability, we could actually kill two birds with one stone. 
And this is the challenge that I lay down to uh, the national government. Uh, because actually there are huge amounts of opportunity, there are huge opportunities to improve housing affordability by allowing intensification in those areas of the city where land is most valuable. And I have to say, land values are highest in the inner suburbs and central city of Auckland because that is where people want to be. And it's true that at the moment the district plan rules do not allow um, an adequate number of dwellings and businesses uh, to be put in place where those land values are high. But that's got nothing to do with the Resource Management Act. Do not be deceived. When the national government talks about reforming the Resource Management Act in order to achieve the goal of housing affordability, what they are really talking about is gutting the fundamental world-leading law that protects our natural pristine environment. And I know that New Zealanders care a good deal about our natural environment. They want to protect it. They want to look after it. And we can have development. We can have sustainable development. We can have jobs without getting the Resource Management Act. In fact, changing the Resource Management Act, the purpose and principles, is neither necessary nor sufficient to solve the problem of onerous rules in district plans. The onerous rules in district plans that people really dislike, you know, that make it a little more difficult for them to put a deck on or uh, develop, let's say, a multi-unit multi, multi um, unit, um, apartment, multi-dwelling unit, um, those rules that make it difficult have nothing to do with the RMA. They're rules that have been rolled over from the old district plans that existed under the Town and Country Planning Act. And under the existing Resource Management Act, the government has the ability, through a national policy statement or a national environmental standard, to, uh, to change those rules and to free up, um, free up the land that is the most valuable for the type of development that Aucklanders really want. And I'd say that it's very clear through their choice um, at local body level that Aucklanders support the vision of a compact city with good public transport, public transport that works, safe walking and cycling, a livable community. And the, the amazing thing about this is that it, it actually costs less than what we're currently doing. It costs less. But unfortunately, the national government is doing the exact opposite. What they want to do is free up Greenfield's land uh, well to the south and well to the north of Auckland, and they're actually putting in place, um, they're spending the vast majority of the money, rather than investing in uh, good public transport, which is what Aucklanders want, they're spending the money on a few extremely expensive motorways that will not do anything to reduce congestion. Now, it's interesting because I heard a member earlier tonight, Mike Sabin, mention that uh, we needed to have evidence of investment to support policy. Uh, we need to have investment, uh, evidence of a return on investment before we implement policy. And then, ironically, he was um, saying how deeply ha happy he was that Puhoi to Wellsford uh, was going to be implemented when the evidence demonstrates that Puhoy's to Wellsford is not the best value investment. In fact, it's one of the worst. It's got one of the worst business cases of any of the projects that this government is pouring billions of dollars into. So, uh, ironically, ironically, the national government says that they care about economic development. They say they care about affordable housing. They say they care about efficient transport. But when we look at the evidence of what they're actually doing, they're doing the exact opposite. What they are putting in place is going to condemn Aucklanders to decades of terrible traffic congestion, just like Los Angeles has with its many motorways. Decades of terrible traffic congestion, very high transport costs for households, not only <laughs> Are households going to be forced to own multiple vehicles, whether or not they'd like to, to run those vehicles, whether or not fuel prices are increasing? But this government is also putting up fuel taxes to pay for these uneconomic motorways. Uh, Auckland is potentially, Auckland is potentially going to have to put on tolls on existing motorways to pay for essential transport investment that they should have had decades ago. We're finally getting electrification of Auckland's rail network now after 80 years, um, 80 years after other cities overseas electrified their rail networks, 60 years after Wellington electrified its, its its rail network, and in fact, it was it was the previous Labour government, 2007, who finally agreed to electrification once the Green Party's campaign forced them to. But 
Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to say that, this, that we have so many opportunities for a smart green economy, for a livable city in Auckland, for affordable housing and transport, and I hope that this national government will actually listen to sense and start implementing sensible evidence-based policy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.